Okay, this webinar is going to co cover AllCAD capture and setting properties and how you drive things like billing materials and netlists. And it's also going to cover the AllCAD database solutions, which include tools such as AllCAD CIS, AllCAD CIP, um, AllCAD Library Builder. There's also something called uh, Ultra Librarian for AllCAD. Uh, and also ways to access footprints and schematic symbols just free from the web as well. So we're going to cover quite a few things today. So we're going to start off with a typical kind of AllCAD capture flow. Um, so in general, when people add parts, what they tend to use is they will use the place part. So we're going to place part, open the page, place part menu. Um, you browse for a library that you specifically want. So in this example, I'm just going to add a resistor. I double click to add the resistor and I can put a couple of resistors down. Now in general these resistors here, um, unless you've stored properties with the, the actual graphical library, so the resistor library, um, which would drive the property list in here, which again is work for use for your bill of materials and your net list. Or what I can do here is, so people will either add the properties manually, they'll come along and just make a change, so I'll make that a 10k resistor and maybe I'll make this a 120k resistor. Um, and then you would add properties like a manufacturer, manufacturing part number, etc. And this can be done by just clicking on the new property and typing in the property name, so manufacturer, uh, maybe it's a Bournes part, and you would add, maybe add a Bournes part number as well, or manufacturing part number. That property then gets added to the, to the properties for that specific component. And then um, you use that in your bill of materials report, or you use the PCB footprint, for example, to drive the netlist that you go and generate for PCB. This is all quite a manual process, and there's um, lots of editing and lots of it's, it's error prone because you know I might come along and instead of this being a 10k, I might have a manufacturing part number for a 10k, but then I may well change this to 120k, but I haven't changed that manufacturing part number or a company part number if I had all of that kind of thing. So it's very very error prone um, and can be quite risky, but this, this is the way some people manage it using an AllCAD capture flow. There is also an, uh, uh, some free apps available. Um, so I can select a part and I can do a right click more. And then I've got something called Part Link powered by DigiKey that will launch a, an app that will allow me to go and search for 120K. Maybe it's a, an i805. Maybe I want a, uh, let's just leave it at that one for now. And um, we'll do a search. <coughs> These are coming the, the results that it's found on the DigiKey website, so we can go and find, let's just see if we've got a, uh, let's just add a Bournes to this search, so we'll let, change the filter. So we've got some, some Bournes resistors, 120K. When I click on the resistor itself, by default it's gonna add um, a, distribute part, a distributor part number, a distributor, the manufacturer, the manufacturing part number. Maybe I wanted to also add, uh, let's add the quantity, I haven't got any on quantity. Uh, let's, Add a. Let's just pick the height property for example. So I can actually just say let's go and add a height property here as well. And then if I apply this to the selected part, now this resistor effectively has the distributor, the distributor part number, the manufacturer, manufacturing part number, and the height. So that app is actually available um, from the website. So if you go to orcad.co.uk, and then if we scroll down to the very very bottom, there's something called Orcad Apps. And when we go to the AllCAD apps, there's one called PartLink powered by DigiKey. And then you can effectively go and get this, add it to the cart, download this app, um, and then you'll find going forward that you'll be able to use this, um, that little DigiKey method. So that's a free method of doing this type of thing, okay? Um, what I really wanna show you is um, something that's a bit more structured. So it's something called the AllCAD database solution, and it allows you to add all the properties to a, um, a Windows compliant ODBC database. So if you go to any computer or any Windows computer, we go to the control panel, admin tools, there's something called an ODBC data source. So if you open the data sources, we can actually add a data source. So it could be an access driver, so Microsoft Access. It can be um, like an Excel, so Microsoft Excel as a driver or um, the preferred mode really nowadays is, is an SQL database. So you can use something like uh, SQL Express, which is the free version. Um, and you can generate a, a link to your database that AllCAD Capture CIS will use. Um, and I can actually store the property information in a database. So instead of me using place part, what I tend to do now is I use place database part. So we'll just launch the CIS Explorer. Um, so there's my database, I can expand it out. So I have tables for all the different types of components. Uh, and under these, these tables, I've got um, some subfolders. Um, so I've got an SMD folder, 
thick film and thin film. I've got all my different footprint sizes. And then you can see here, I've got a table of all the different parts. So lots and lots of different values. Um, they're all referencing effectively the same schematic part. So I have a, a global schematic resistor that you saw me place earlier on, reference to a PCB footprint and a value. When I select the part, what happens is it, initially it goes green because it's got all the valid properties that are available there. It's going to give me a preview to the schematic symbol. It's going to give me a preview to the PCB footprint. Um, and because this database is set up in such a way that it uses relational data, I can have multiple supplier information or manufacturing information for the same company part number. So Viché and Borns. I've also got a Borns link here because it's using something called Silicon Expert where I'm getting compliance data. Um, so if I find the part that I want, I effectively I double click to, um, let's just double click to place this part on the canvas. And when I put these parts down, when I look now at the properties for the parts, you can see that property information is already populated there, which can save you a lot of time. It's simplifying my graphical library representation. Um, and it allows me to manage parts a, a lot better ways. Okay, so that's one way to obviously manage all your, your bill of materials information um, with CIS. Now the other thing with CIS um, is it gives me something called part manager, which allows me to, to error check and to manually define um, and control how my parts are sorted out. So engineers being engineers will make this type of change. They will come along and I will make that resistor value change. But what I haven't done here is I haven't changed the underlying uh, company part number. So even the description still says 243 ohms. I've got a manufacturing part number for a 243 ohm and a company part number that's referencing that. All the other settings, I mean, obviously I've just changed the value property. Um, but I've got nowhere to find or catch this type of error. So I might not find this error until effectively I've, I've netlisted, I've had my board designed, I've output a bill of materials. I might spot it manually doing a check on the bill of materials, but who knows? More than likely what's going to happen is that my board will go out, it'll get built, it'll come back and I'll be on the test bench and I'll, I'll look at it and go, what's going on here? I'm getting some odd results. And then you'll look at it and go, oh, I forgot to effectively change the part number. So I've changed the value, but I've not changed the part number and it's fitted the, a 243 ohm resistor. So using part manager, so we'll just launch part manager. We can either launch it from the tools menu or I can just do a right click part manager. It, first of all, it gives me um, a list of every single part in my design. Okay, so these are all my parts and it works on a traffic light status, traffic light space status. So obviously I've got red, yellow and green. Greens means everything's okay. So these are approved, but it hasn't been synchronized. So we can obviously do a, a tools update or part status. You can use the control U. Now this will now effectively do a comparison between my schematic contents and my database contents. So I found an error. I'm just going to say no to that for now. It carries on running through the rest of the synchronization. So you'll see most of these parts here go to this approved current stage, which means that they're in sync with the database, all the properties that match the database contents. And we'll scroll down to that one resistor, the R435 that I modified manually. It's approved, but it's not current. So there's an issue with this part. So what I can do is I can select the part here. I can do a right click link database part. It then using the key property, which is value, does a global search for 562 ohms. So I want an 805 562 ohm resistor. Now if I select this, we'll just expand these windows so you can just see what's going on. You can see now effectively I get what the schematic contents is, what the actual database contents is. And the, the issues, the properties that have issues is obviously the part number because I've got a different resistor value, the description, same scenario, and my company part number. So what I want to do is I actually want to go ahead and use these. So I'll literally just go right click and we'll link database part. We'll say yes to that and it effectively makes a change to the data. So we'll just do another update. We'll just synchronize everything. And you'll see now that R35 has gone green. The part number has been updated and it's done all the properties. So if we actually go back to the part on the canvas, we'll just compare these two parts together. So we'll select them and do an edit properties. You can see it's actually done those changes for me. So I now know um, before I send my bill of materials or my netlist out, the data is valid and the data is up to date. So quite a useful function to enable me to do this. Part Manager also gives me the ability to do global changes to the schematic. So what I could do is if if I did something like sort by value, maybe I wanted to change all of my four, four, oh, sorry my 47.5 ohm resistors. So I can select those resistors and then do the link database part, come into here, instead of it being a 47.5 ohm resistor, what I actually want it to be is I want it to be a, let's go back to the 562. So I could then do a search for the 562 and again, select right click link database part and it would make the change. So quick and easy ways to make changes to, to, to the design data once you've got it all done. 
The other thing that Park Manager gives me is it gives me the ability to, to do variant design, control variant bombs and variant views of the schematic. So you have effectively a, a group and a um, lots of groups in the in, in the in the project itself. So initially you would have a common folder that is effectively that common folder is all the parts that are used in every single variant. Okay, and then you split your design up into groups and subgroups. So I've got a few examples here. I've got a channel one group effectively that has items that are all fitted or they're not fitted. Channel two with the same scenario. Channel three with memory, and I've got all the memory fitted or half the memory fitted. Groups are pretty easy, so we'll literally just go and create a new one and give you an example. So I want to make a group, so I'm going to do new group, and we'll call this group um, resistors. I'm then going to make uh, two subgroups of this. I'm going to make a UK subgroup, and I'm going to make a US subgroup. So once my groups and subgroups are there, effectively what I need to do is effectively locate the parts that I want to put into that group and drag them across. Now I can do this in one of two ways. I can either just select a part in here and literally just drag and drop it across like that, or I can go to the page in the schematic and I'm going to use these four resistors here. I literally just right click add parts to group and then I can pick the group that I want to add them to. I want to add them to the resistors group. So we'll click add and it adds those items to it. Now if we go back to part manager you'll see if I look at my groups I've effectively got UK and US both contain all of those resistors. So for the UK version of these I'm effectively going to select all of these parts right click set part as not present. I don't want these resistors fitted when I use the UK version. For the US version, what I want to do is I want to make all of these resistors 562 ohms. So I can select all of the resistors that I want to change. Obviously, R35 is already in that state. And we will do link database part. We'll change the value key property. I want to search for 562. And then I'm going to pick the 0805 resistor at the top. And we'll do a link database part. So you'll see now effectively all the resistors in this group. So if I look at the UK, they're not fitted. If I look at the US, they're all 562 ohms. So I then start to populate the bomb variant. So my bomb ver variant version one has the common channel one fitted, channel two not fitted, half the memory. Uh, I'm going to drag the UK version into that. So I literally just drag the UK folder and put it into version one. We'll make a new bomb variant called version two. And then I just drag and drop the folders down. So I need the common based items for version 2. I want channel 1 not fitted. I want channel 2 not fitted. Uh, we'll have half the memory. And we'll, this example will have the US version of the resistors. So I've now built up my two bomb variants. So if we go to the schematic page, first things first, I can actually set a, uh, the schematic page to look like my variant. If I go to the view, variant view mode, I've effectively got my core design, which is what I work on for all, all designs when I'm making changes. If I go to version 1, we'll click OK, what will happen is effectively, initially my resistors, so this is using the UK version, all the resistors are not fitted, so they go to a grey status, the colour, and I've got a property value called not fitted. I can also scroll down and look at my title block. My title block effectively has a variant name property in it, and it will show me version 1 in the title block. So I could then go and generate a, an intelligent PDF of this schematic, and then I've actually got a proper schematic that can be controlled for that specific version. If we go to um, the view and the variant view mode again, we'll go to version 2 this time. You'll see what happens is the resistor values are actually changed on the canvas to show me the correct resistor value. Uh, the properties are changed as well. <coughs> which allows me to effectively, at the end, use this version 2. So if I go and look at the, the title block for this one, this is version 2. I can output my intelligent PDF. And I've got actual variant information on the schematic canvas. The colors of the fitted and not fitted and the different variant parts are all controlled under options and preferences. If we look at the default colors, there's a color option for variant part. There's a color option for uh, part not present. So you can actually control this if you wanted to use some different colors. Now the key thing to remember here is if I need to make a change to my schematic, if I go to the place menu, everything is greyed out. And the main reason for that is obviously because I'm in the variant view mode. And so you should only make changes to the core design. So we'll literally go to view, variant view mode, and go back to the core design. And then we're good to go and we can carry on stock and making changes. <laughs> CIS also gives me um, a better way to manage reports. So um, the typical flow in AllCAD capture is tools, bill of materials. 
you effectively add the property string, your combined property string to your header and your combined property string here for the properties that you want. So if I had a manufacturer or manufacturing part number, I would add a slash T manufacturer and a slash T manufacturer in curly brackets. That would allow me to add the properties and I can output a bit of materials. With CIS, effectively, I get a reports menu. So I can effectively do a CIS bill of materials, standard. And then this allows me to effectively access any property from my database. So in my CIS database, I've got all of these properties available here. I've also got title block properties. And I can add the properties here to control what I want to output my bill of materials. <clears throat> I've obviously got the different versions. I can output to Excel. I can include relational data. I can also include mechanical parts. So if I wanted to do things like every time I fitted a connector, I always had a screw, a nut, and a washer associated with that connector. I could build a relational database for that mechanical part data. In this example, I'm just going to build my two bill of materials for my versions one and version two based on the data that I have there. And this will then go and process and make a bill of materials and export it to Excel. Once the bit of materials are there, if we open an Excel spreadsheet, and we'll just effectively tidy up some of this, you can see obviously this is my version one. So I've got the not fitted values. And there's my version two, again, with all the different alternatives there. The advantage of the CIS reports um, allows me effectively to don't just think of this as a, a bill of materials generator, this is a reports generator. So if you're doing something like a reliability report, I can actually access things like all the power ratings and the tolerances that I would need to do for a generator report. So I can actually have a drop down for different reports and store that as part of the default settings. Just going back to CIS Explorer a little bit, because I didn't cover this earlier on. Um, the properties is, is, is up to you, what you put in here. So obviously there are some key properties that you need. You need a value, you need a part type, you need a schematic part, and you need a part number. But apart from that, if you wanted to add other, other information in here, it's the information that you would need going forward. You can also include things like a datasheet link. So obviously got a datasheet link here, which would then store my, my component part data, um, which can be quite useful. But, Whatever you want to put in a CIS database, effectively, it's up to you from a property point of view. So we'll just close the Explorer down. So the next part of this demo, what I want to do is I want to say, well, what happens if I've got a part that I need to effectively go and generate? So I've got a space here for a part that I specifically need. I know it's not in my database. Um, I need a way to effectively go to this. So we'll go to the CIP tab and I'll log in. This is a way to access my data or my database. So my database is an SQL Express database. It uses something called the Component Information Portal to access this. So this is actually just a different window. It's an HTML window. I can access it from inside AllCAD Capture CIS, or I can also access this from a web, web page. So if I go to um, Cadence, my CIP login, there's my login page. So I'm actually accessing it from an, an HTML browser. Once I've logged in, I can actually look at the part data. So if I pick a capacitors table, for example, you can see effectively I get the part information here, so all my property information that I would see when I'm looking at my CS Explorer data. Um, I get a preview to things like the PCB footprint. So we can look at the PCB footprint. I've got a preview to my schematic symbol. So there's my capacitor. If I wanted to, I could actually place this directly onto the canvas now using this, this method if I wanted to. Um, and then I've got all the part types, the values and stuff. So if I wanted, needed to make a change here, I can effectively just make an edit. And if I make a change to the property information here, as soon as I hit accept, that value property will change. So in fact, let's actually go and make a change. So if we're going to do an edit, I'm going to change the part number. So instead of it being an EMA part number, I'm going to say this is going to be called my company. and I want the part type field to be my company. So I'm going to accept those changes. And then if I go to um, a page, press Z to place a database part, look under capacitors now, effectively I have a my company folder, ceramic, SMD, 0603, and there's my company part. So I could effectively, you can manage the, the, the data that's supplied. It comes with a starter database of a thousand parts. So you can actually manage the data that way and make changes to, to, to the database to suit. If we go back to the CIP tab, what I'm gonna do now is, um, oh, sorry, let's, uh, let's just run through the manufacturing data as well. So for this specific part, I also have different uh, manufacturing data. So different suppliers for that information. Um, so I've got an AVEX part and a Chemex part. Um, I've also got history tabs. 
So if I look at the history tabs, I can see who's made changes, what the changes were, um, which can be really useful when you're trying to trace, do traceability from design. Um, if we go back to the part information, I've got a history for the manufacturing part data as well. So people have made changes to effectively the data that we've got here. There is also a where use tab. So there is an option to upload bit of materials into the component information portal. Um, so once I upload a bit of materials, it will tell me that this capacitor is used specifically on these two bit of materials. So if you've uh, got some part obsolescence and you want to try and find out which bit of materials you're using, if you start to upload your bit of materials into the CIP portal, effectively it gives you the ability to do this. So let's go back to CIP. What we're going to do now is... Um, Let's do a distributed search. So I'm looking, I need to add a new part. Okay, so by default, when people add new parts to databases, say I'm using an, um, an access database, I would probably close capture CIS down, I'd go to the web, I'd probably look on people like, you know, component supplier information, I might find some distributor information, I'd find the keyword and then I'd copy and paste the data from the website, the, the, the data sheet that I've got to, to make a new entry in my database that I could then go and place a part. Using the component information portal, what I can do is it allows me to effectively search people like Arrow, Arrow DigiKey, Future, Mauser, Farnell, and RS for any specific part. So I'm going to go and look for an AD9850, and I'm going to click on search. This then goes off to those distributor websites. So let's come back with a few hits. I've got some from Mauser. I can see their quantity on hand. I can also see their costing information. So this can be really, really useful if you use those people to buy, because you can actually add those properties to your database. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick one of these, we'll pick the Mauser one, it gives me the property numbers that it's going to use, so it's going to populate my database with some of these properties. I get a link to their data sheet as well. So if I'm happy with this part, I can effectively say let's go and pick the ICs table. Now I've got an option to either create a temporary part or add to an existing part. If I wanted to add it to an existing part, this would effectively give me the alternative supplier, so that's a method for that. I'm going to create a temporary part because this is a new part. From a schematic symbol point of view, I can either choose from any other parts in the ICs library, or that are in the ICs table effectively, or I can effectively say new, and, and either type in the name that I wanted in here, or I could just say, no, I'm just gonna use uh, unassigned for now because I haven't got a schematic part for this. PCB footprint is exactly the same way. It's gonna browse and give me a list of all the PCB footprints that are available in my ICs table at the moment. This is an SSOP. 28 so we'll just look for a 28 pin SSOP that's good enough I then click on add and then it adds that part to my database as a temporary part number effectively so I've now got temporary part 373 so if I go to the the schematic page press Z this time we'll find our ICs table I've now got this unassigned part type because that tied in with the unassigned part type for part type here um, and effectively, there's my temporary part 373. I don't have a schematic symbol for this at the moment, so um, what I need to do is go and sort that out first. So if we go back to the CI, well, in fact, let's just close the tab down there for CIS Explorer. And if we go back to our CIP tab, what I can do is I can start to, to look at the data that I've got. So it's populated some of the fields. Distributors don't have every single bit of information, but I can make edits here if I wish to. So I can do an edit here. And we'll start off, maybe I need to say, I'll populate the number of pins. My package height is 1.75. And you can see it's using a filter for the other fields in this window. So um, it will make you allow you to be more consistent with the data that you're putting down. Um, what we'll do is in here, we'll put my company slash uh, SMD slash, this is a synth. So that will then populate that. Um, Package size is going to be an SSOP 28. And instead of it being package type of this, I always want to say we always use SMD. So we'll just pick SMD for that point of view. Um, there is an auto assign for some of these fields. So this is auto assign or auto build will use other property values to populate some of these. Um, but in this example, I'm just going to auto populate the part number, which gives me the next company part number. Um, and in general, I'm happy with that data for now. I need to sort out the schematic part still, but if I click OK, that then populates all that data and updates that information in my database. From a schematic symbol point of view, I've got several ways to, to generate symbols and PCB footprints. There's a free way, so I can effectively, I can just go to the OCAD capture window. Um, and if I actually use the P button here, I've got a search functionality. So I can say, 
Does Cadence provide me with some default schematic symbols? They, they give you 44,000, so there might be a good chance it might be some. So if I actually do a search for AD9, and um, we'll click on the little search button, I can browse to the folders where I'm looking. So it's the default installation folder, capture library, click OK. Uh, and if I do a search here, there is some parts here. And we're going to get the AD98. Nope, so we stop at AD97. So I can either take an existing part here and modify that in the library. I could draw the part manually from a file, new library, and generate a schematic symbol. There are other videos showing this type of methodology. Um, there are also free, way, free options on the web. So if we go to something like, um, we'll just go and do a Google search. Let's go to uh, parts. I've got effectively several ways. So there's a there's a website called Semexis and that offers schematic symbols. There's something called Snap EDA that offers schematic symbols. Let's just go to Snap EDA and see what they've got. So let's just type AD9850. Yeah, they've got a few here, and we can obviously if we go to the data available. Once you've logged in, you can effectively just download the footprint. Um, there's a similar schematic symbol, like a download the schematic symbol. So that's a free way of doing this. Um, let's look at another free way. If we go to the uh, Ultra Librarian website, uh, we'll do the same search, AD9850, and hit search. They've got some here, so obviously I've got a preview for a schematic symbol. I've got a preview for the PCB footprint. So I get the, effectively the minimum, the maximum, and the nominal base footprints of the an SSOP28. I'm also getting something like a 3D step model. So I've got a, a nice 3D step model here that I could use. Um, now Ultra Librarian effectively, so it's ultralibrarian.com. If I register and log in, I can download 10 parts a month for free, effectively. So this would be one part and it would give me the schematic symbol, the PCB footprint and the 3D step model. By clicking on select, that would download all of those parts for me. I could also use effectively the Ultra Librarian app. So this is a subscription service that you have to pay for. It gives you 1200 parts to download. So I could then either pick a, a, a manufacturer, and you, I'll just scroll through some of the manufacturers so you can see who's supported here. So there's quite a few. Um, in this example, I'm just going to again do the AD9850. We'll do a search. Similar thing to the web browse, but um, with the subscription service, this makes it a lot easier. So if I find the part that I want, so if I preview that schematic symbol and close, actually I want to go and download that. So let's just go and place. Sorry, let's place it. It generates the symbol, and then that part's there ready for me to go and place on my schematic. So that makes it a lot easier. <clears throat> and again, the part count changes. So I could do the footprint here as well, the same for the 3D step model. Um, this subscription service, the Ultra Librarian subscription service, actually comes as part of the ORCAD database solution. So you'll get effectively CIS, you'll get CIP, and you'll get the subscription service auto librarian. So something to consider. If you're interested in that, please contact sales at Parallel Systems. If we go back to CIP, I'll give you another method for doing this effectively. So um, with those parts, they're kind of pre-baked, if you like. They're already made. The pin positions are already set as they want. Sometimes that's good enough for people. That's all they want to use. Other people want to be very specific about how they generate schematic symbols and PCB footprints. So the data sheet here link gives me a button here so I can launch AllCAD Library Builder. So AllCAD Library Builder will give me the ability to, to generate a schematic symbol directly from a PDF data sheet. So uh, I'll pick a library that I want to check this one into. So we'll just go and pick um, a library name. I'm going to give it a name of uh, Steve underscore AD98850. I'm not going to worry about creating a footprint, but I could create a footprint here as well if I wanted to. So when all Cadillac Bibles is launched, what it does is it loads that data sheet directly in. So um, we actually just start to pan through this. What I'm looking for is the pin information, the pin table. So we'll just zoom in here. So I've got a pin configuration. I can extract the information from here, but I've got a nice pin table here that I can use. So what we'll do is we'll effectively we'll use the, the select the area. We'll just define the boundary and then we'll draw a window around the text that we want to effectively come in. Uh, didn't quite get that right, so let's just close that and do that again. That's a bit more like it, so I'll do space between and we'll generate. And you can see it auto generates the, some lines here. Once I'm going to do that, I'm going to optimize the data and it starts to effectively sort my data out. So you can see most of the pin information, pin number, and pin name have been built been brought in correctly apart from kind of this first area here 
I've got a little bit of an issue here. So what we'll do is we'll close this. Um, I'll use the delete button because I can manually do these lines as well. And I'll delete that additional line and then I'll add a vertical, vertical line in here. And effectively I've now split up my pin number and my pin name. So I can then extract this data and it goes into what they class as a scratch pad area. The main reason for this is obviously on this data sheet I've got one pin table. But if I had a, a large FP, FPGA, um, what I would need to do is effectively I might need to extract several pin table information. So I would then go to the next page, define the boundary, repeat the steps I've just done and extract the data. And, and keep doing that on all the pin tables until you have all the information in the scratch pad area. Once you're happy with that, you go to the scratch pad area using this little button up here and you can then effectively see the data that I've got ready to, to start to use. So I'm going to give this some, some headings. I'm going to use pin number for this one and we'll use pin name for this one. But you can see there are other options you can add. So if you wanted to bring in more information for your schematic symbol uh, or CAD library builder can handle it. Once I'm happy with that, I just do a right click, copy to symbol view and we'll copy and switch. And then it starts to run some automated checks. So initially it says, I don't like the word two, I'm going to replace the word two with a space, with a dash, sorry, okay? So in that example, I'm just going to apply that one. It does that. Um, it then doesn't like the spaces between here, so we'll apply that one. And I've got a couple of options. I've got one there and one down there. We'll do this one and we'll do it individually. So I'm going to apply selected to that one. But in this example, I've got two pin names and only one pin number. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace the space with an underscore. And we'll just apply it to that one. We then go back up and sort the, the, the number out. So we'll apply that one and we'll remove the spaces. It then expands the bus out automatically and it now adds a new column called direction. And it's now saying that my pin direction may be wrong. And if I start to pan through some of these, obviously grounds, VDDs, clocks, etc. I didn't pick this column in. So instead of doing these individually, what I can do is I just do apply all and it will do its best to populate the values based on some key properties. Um, we can obviously make changes to this afterwards if need be as well. So the next thing it says is um, pin functions effectively have, have not been specified. So it's looking at the word clock and saying you can actually assign a, a, a pin function of clock, which will give you a different pin graphic. So we'll just apply both of those. It's found some duplicate pin names. Um, now obviously if the pin type is power or CAD capture will accept duplicate pin names without any issue. So we'll just apply all of those. It then wants to go and save the symbol and it then goes into placement mode. Now I'm not ready to go in placement mode, so we'll just uncheck this box for now and we'll start to look at some of these columns. So this is just data effectively. If I needed to make changes here, maybe I wanted to call that pin one, I could effectively just double click and make a change here and make an edit. So, um, but there are other options, obviously for the pin directions, I want to fill some of these. So I'm gonna drag select or control select these columns and then I can do a right click fill and I can specify input because I know these are input pins. And then I've also got some negative style pins. So I want the two B pins and then the V and N and we'll fill that with a negative style. So you can make changes to this data before you go into pin placement mode, okay? Once you're happy with that, we go into the symbol mode or edit the symbol graphics. And effectively I can start to then look at assigning my pins. Now there are options, tools, pin assignment, auto assign by rules. And then allow you to put like your inputs on your left, your outputs on the right whatever you want to do. Um, but most engineers would probably want to be very specific about where they put their pins. So I can just go and pick the pins that I want. So I'm going to start off with a clock in pin and we'll assign that left. So we'll click on uh, the left assign and I assign the pin. I then want the reset pin. Um, and if I do a single click here, effectively the pin then gets <coughs> added at one grid space. I don't want to do that yet. So what I want to do is I want an, an additional space. If I use the control and the left click, Sorry, let me just do that properly. So we'll do control and left click. I would then get two pin spaces. So we'll do that one with a single click. I want these two pins next with a control click. I want these pins next with a control click. I then want the V in N with a control click. And you can see the different pin graphic here. And then my DA, DACBL negative L NC pin potential. So that's given me all of my inputs. Um, so output wise, I effectively want my IO out and my IO out B and then my Q out and my Q out B. Once I've got all my inputs and outputs, I'm just going to drag select some pins and using the control and arrow keys, I can effectively reposition the pins where I want them to go. I can adjust the width and the height. So these are auto manual. So I can't obviously reduce the height smaller than something that I wouldn't be allowed to. Um, but from a width point of view, I've reduced the width. 
um, the height, if I try to make it smaller, it's only going to maximize it on the size that's there. So 24 is the, the maximum size because of the pins that we have here. Um, I want to go and do my power and ground pins now. So I'm just going to go and create a new section and I'll put my ground pins along the bottom and my A ground pins next to them and then my DVBD and my ABBD along the top. We'll just adjust the width and the height. And that's my schematic symbol, I'm ready to go. So effectively, I can save this. Uh, this then writes the file out. Just just so you're aware, found, um, what we'll do is we can then do effectively an, an export to AutoCAD Capture. This would effectively allow me to go and generate the schematic symbol. So we'll do an export and it's exported this. So I'll log back into CIP. And you can see now what's happened is effectively my schematic part has been actually added. So this is the library name, this is the name of the schematic symbol. So if I did a preview of that, there's my sections A and section B. So we can then close that. Um, we'll go to my DDS page. Let's just delete that one. And if we go to the CIS Explorer window now, we'll expand that out. We've got an ICs, my company, SMD Synth. There's my part. I've got a schematic symbol, a PCB footprint, and I'm good to go and place this if I needed to. That concludes this webinar. Uh, I hope you find it useful. Uh, if you have any questions, please let us know.